On the regenerative journey, our goal is to nurture and facilitate the lives and journeys of all our followers, which is why we've teamed up with Resource Consulting Service, RCS, Australia's leading provider of education and advisory services in regenerative agriculture. RCS trains and consults across the ag sector from individuals and families through to corporates and even government, empowering people to grow productive and profitable businesses in diverse and, importantly, healthy landscapes. They understand that the future of healthy families, resilient communities and regenerative farming lies in holistic education. Over the last 15 years, they've played an integral role in my own regenerative journey. And I have a lot to thank RCS for, and I'm one of 7,500 others who have attended their farming and grazing for profit course. I don't know where I'd actually be, uh, and I certainly wouldn't be this far down my own regenerative journey if I hadn't completed a significant amount of training with the RCS team. I can't recommend more highly uh, RCS to anyone looking to start their regenerative journey in a supportive and proven environment. Terry, McCosca, and your team, you absolutely rock. And we're also absolutely stoked to be collaborating with them now. For my listeners only, we're offering a 10% discount on all farming and grazing for profit schools and grazing clinics in Australia this year. If you add this to the early bird rate of a seven-day school, you could get a whopping $1,000 off the standard price. Simply add the code CHARLIERCS, that's CHARLIERCS, that's one word, at the checkout to get your concession. How awesome is that? Now head to the show notes to find out more. You know, so having that lesson so acutely demonstrated and so violently demonstrated and so horrendously demonstrated early, you know, just put a huge bias on insane quality product. You know, the, the one the one thing that people will never be able to say is that it was a shit quality product or mm-hmm. that the product didn't have deep integrity. That was Glenn Carlson and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. From wherever we are, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, recognising their continuing connection to this land, its waterways, the stars in the skies since time immemorial. We pay our respects to the elders, knowledge holders and to all the generations of First Nations peoples who have nurtured their unceded sovereign lands for over 80,000 years and continue to do so today. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer and in this podcast series I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host Charlie Arnott. G'day, welcome back to The Regenerative Journey, and this week's episode is with Glenn Carlson, but before I bang on about Glenn, I just want to reference uh, an event put on, about by, put on by our partners, RCS, it's on the 16th and 17th of July, in Brisbane at the Convention and Exhibition Centre, and it's all about the convergence of agriculture, human and planetary health. This decade we've ri- witnessed global systems on the brink of collapse um, and already we're seeing climate chaos, species disappearing and land degradation at alarming rates. And at the RCS conference in July, we'll explore the role agriculture can play in restoring and regenerating those systems and how the convergence of agriculture, human and planetary health is vital for our survival. I reckon that's pretty important. We're bringing together extraordinary minds from across the globe to cast a long view over the opportunities and challenges ahead. And for those who can't make it in person, you'll be able to attend virtually. So join RCS for two days in Brisbane for the extraordinary conference, uh, Convergence, Agriculture, Human and Planetary Health. And see our show notes for uh, registration details and go to the website, rcsc2022.com. Dot au. That's uh, www.rcsc2022.com.au. Don't miss it. I'll be there. Uh, and it's going to be an aw- awesome. The guys at RCS cancelled that, I think it was two years ago, 2020, they were going to put it on. Um, so it's wonderful that they have pulled it together and um, got some wonderful um, international speakers um, coming in virtually, obviously. There's quite a few that will be there in person, so it's going to be fantastic. Another quick thing before I sort of slip into Glenn's um, little intro there is what, ha- what happened to COVID. I'm fascinated um, about where what's happened. It's been it's been some 
pretty big um, events happening in Australia here, floods in the Northern Rivers and sort of around Sydney. In the last month, um, there's been, you know, Russia's invaded Ukraine. <clears throat> I'm still trying to get my head around what that all means. Or sort of who, who <laughs> who's who in the zoo there and who else is involved. Um, and COVID's just like, no, nah, oh, it's all gone. But what is interesting, what is interesting, I'll just make a note of, is that um, what is on the mainstream media at the moment is, seems to, I saw a, um, a thing popped up on my feed or someone sent me something the other day um, on a major news uh, channel in Australia here. Um, there was a story about a lady who had a heart attack at 52 and saying, oh, it's genetic and it's, you know, I, I guess the intention was trying to make it sound like it was that kind of thing was was kind of normal or you know it can be expected and it's genetic so we can't do much about it. Um, which I think is interesting that <laughs> that's even that's even come up. When have we ever seen? When have we ever seen a story like that come up before? Um, yeah, no, I thought it was fascinating that 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 seems to be like oh no no yeah no people people. Dying at fifty-two of heart attack, you know, females. It's that's normal. That that can happen. I think it's complete bollocks. I think it's um, just trying to trying to make what 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 make normal what is totally not normal at this point in time. Um, I don't think I'll go any further than that, but I, I just don't think that I think that the um, uh, you know things that are popping up in mainstream media now is very telling as to how they're not covering tracks, but just trying to justify what they've been doing for the last couple of years. Anyway, enough of that. I won't bang on too much more. What I do want to bang on about is our um, biodynamic workshops. We finished one last week at Hannah Mino, the two-day inter- two introduction to biodynamics, which is wonderful. Our next um, couple of uh, workshops are down in the in South Australia, in the crow eating part of the world. Um, down there at uh, uh, Koleski Wines on the 2nd and 3rd of May. Very excited to go down there and see Kim and... Uh, Amy and family there, um, and also in the McLaren Vale with Melissa and Mike, who hosted us last year as well, about the same time. Um, we're going to be doing some um, uh, also in spring in WA. We're lining up to do a few over there, uh, and also in Victoria and Tasmania in spring. It's going to be pretty busy because we've got a bit of time, a bit of, few, few workshops to make up for that we um, we postponed back in autumn, this very autumn. Um, don't forget you can buy... Um, gift vouchers as well so pay it forward if there's someone you love and you'd love them to know more about biodynamics and you could think that their garden could do with a bit of a hit or their farm or whatever your in in, in your um <laughs> incentive or motivation is jump on the website charliearnett.com.au and pick up a gift voucher for them and pay it forward i think it's just a wonderful idea that um your you know contribution and 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 um uh, helping others, just sort of, you know, if, if you think it's going to help their farming practices. And, and it's not always about farming either, just quietly. It's um, it's a lot to do with the uh, with them as a human, and, and that's what we talk about a lot in the course as well, the individuality and sovereignty and so on. So it's not just about how to grow a better carrot or a better cow. Um, so don't forget those gift vouchers. Now on to Glenn. Um, Glenn Carlson, he is um, he's fantastic. He's the co-founder of Dent Global and KPI Accelerator, um, which I am currently doing at the moment with Glenn, and it's been fantastic. Um, he develops personal brands. He makes them more visible and valuable and scalable. Um, he's just um, fantastic. I met Glenn. Uh, I actually had been given his book. Well, the book that he promotes, um, his mate Daniel Priestley wrote, KPI, Key Person of Influence, some years ago actually now and then I did a, it's like a two hour online course there it might have been last year year before I actually remember pretty well I was driving down from Sydney to Milton to do a biodynamics workshop listening to Glenn and then met him at a meditation workshop last year with um, Nico Plowman who is in um, who, who I interviewed on the on the podcast in season season two or three might have been um, season two Met Glenn there. It was very serendipitous because I'd wanted, I'd been wanting to sort of do more of his KPI stuff. He was there. We were sort of on on the on the page with with, um, with meditation and subsequently um, chatting about regenerative agriculture and farming. And he's since bought himself a little farm um, with a buddy up at um, near Coffs Harbour at Bonville. Um, I won't give you his exact address. I don't think I'm allowed to. You might, you might go and stalk him. 
Um, but he's up there with his family and it's a fantastic little place. So I interviewed Glenn up there on the farm. Uh, it was raining, so there's a little bit of pitter-patter in the background and a few other things happened. Um, his, his lovely mum, Gloria, was sitting on the couch beside us pretending to read, but I think she was really listening in to see that Glenn didn't say anything derogatory. Um, but it's a fantastic interview. He's such a he's such a chatty pants, uh, which we love, and he's got he's very articulate, and um, he's good at identifying sort of tips and tricks and sort of the turning points and along his own regenerative journey. So look, I I, I trust you enjoy um, listening to this episode of uh, the regenerative journey with Glenn Carlson as as much as I I loved uh, recording and sitting with the man himself, Glenn Carlson. Isn't that going to run out of power? No. All right. Maybe. We're on. No, mate. I think I've charged it up. I hope so. Anyway, we're on. Glenn Carlson, welcome to the regenerative journey, and welcome to your kitchen. Your new, your new <laughs> my, kitchen, my new kitchen, <laughs> brand new. Well, it's probably not that brand. Is it no, brand it's, it's actually forty years old with a renovation really? that got thrown thrown in it about ten years ago, and we're about to rip it to bits. So. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> to the just this is like a demo. This is a demo party. This is a demo interview, um, de- as in not demonstration, a demolition. Demolition. Um, Glenn, we are sitting, uh, and again, welcome to the regenerative journey. And, and as is the my um, uh, my brief to you for this show, which I probably didn't explain very well. You didn't send me a brief. <laughs> <laughs> That's the brief because there is none. No brief. Um, the brief is that I interview people, guests, men and women, and the, the idea being to un, un, to dig up, to understand, to divulge tips and tricks, turning points, tension events along your regenerative journey. It's been pretty short. <clears throat> But well, not well. Yes, and I'm not talking about regenerative farming either. This um, is this is regenerative living. This is regenerative life. This is about the regeneration of oneself in yeah. whatever form that takes. Beautiful. So for you, I know, and this is how we sort of well, not exactly how we got to meet, but but um, it is related to your farming journey. Um, but I'm I suspect your regenerative living life journey started many years before in some way mm. um, in some you know defined by I don't know stuff we're going to we're going to discover so mate um, before we do discover that I'd like you just to sort of give me a bit of a heads up on where we are and why this place is special to you is it special and what are we looking at and what does it mean to you uh, so we're looking out uh, over what is to be a, fo- a, a, a food forest? We're looking at out over a, a pecan and a macadamia and a. I'll give the, I'll give the YouTube a mango a there. tree there. there. Mango. Here we are. Uh, so this is our new property. We settled on this uh, three weeks ago now. So it's yep. brand new. Um, just out of Coffs Harbour, a little spot called Bonville. So we are on thirty acres. We're ten minutes from the beach. We've got a Beautiful view of the hill. Uh, it's a big hill. And, uh, mate, we love the place. We co-own it with some good friends of ours who have the, the house next door. So we thought, what an opportunity to, A, choose our neighbours and, B, pull our resources, not just financially, but something this well, big for me, having come out of Bondi and what have you, sort of historically living in cities and Square apartments. And, 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly that, exactly right. You know, Basil playing on the balcony, dying. Um, this <laughs> would have we're going to change that. Part, it, right? <laughs> this, this would have been a, um, a bridge too far. Mm. And however, with a, with a running mate, Luke, the idea of us being able to put our heads together and uh, solve sort of bigger problems and you know create create something really meaningful not just for us but really for our kids i think it was where a lot of the intention of this came from wanted to get out of the city he was he was living in in the middle of sydney and just decided that there was more to life than that and have you found more to life than what you were doing where you were uh, is this is this is this your forever home do you think Forever's a long time. 
uh, and my history uh, suggests that uh, that labeling something as forever is uh, is probably an exercise in hubris. Um, so, but look, j- just prior to COVID, well, actually, if we go back, so my daughter was born a bit over two and a half years ago at home, Bondi Beach, which is where we were uh, where we were living, and. The idea was we wanted to move out of Bondi. I'd been there for seven years. Sarah, who's from Wagga Wagga, Mm. uh, had been there for two with me. Um, And we just had the sense that that wasn't where we wanted to raise a family. You know, we didn't want the schools and the idea of just riding down the road with mates. It's like, well, Bondi, it just didn't feel right. Mm. So we're looking at our north, you know, northern beaches. We're looking at our south, southern coast, the rural, those sorts of areas. And there was just nothing charming. Nothing just sprung up and said adventure. Um, COVID started building. Things started getting weird. They were shutting down the beach. The police were lining up on Bondi Beach, not letting anyone on. And it was all just getting a bit, like, creepy. And this is in 2020? Yeah, January 2020, right? Yeah, Uh, I don't know. And... Um, the lease on our place in Bondi was coming up. Well, actually, we just had the opportunity. The owners were happy to move back, so they were happy to let us out whenever we wanted. We only got that place temporarily to to give birth to to Mila, our daughter. And I was flipping through realestate.com and my mum randomly on some other conversation mentioned the word Jindabai. Now I'd gone to Jindabai a few times snowboarding and what have you and I just typed in Jindabyne and the first hit that came up just to rent was this gorgeous seven bedroom place on five acres so it's basically going from what we were in in Bondi and and almost tripling it for less than half the price Mm. and I I came downstairs and I said to Sarah you up for an adventure and she (laughs) said yeah what are you thinking it's like well what about we move to Jindabyne and she's like where's (laughs) Jindabyne Not that big of an adventure. <laughs> and uh, she loved the idea. I drove down to make sure the internet was good because that was sort of my connection to my business. Mm. It was, and within two weeks we were in. Mm. So it was bang, just a, a rapid fire. And that was my first exposure to acreage, my first exposure to being a bit more connected to the land while the world was losing its mind with, with COVID and restrictions and lockdowns. You know, we've got miles of mountain bike tracks and trails and lakes and, you know, waterfalls and just – beautifulness and so it's it sort of felt like the the wave of COVID rolled over the whole world and yet we were in this nice little bubble and I fell in love and Sarah and I fell in love with being on the land now I'm not sure if you could call five acres the land but totally you know started growing some carrots and some Mm. spuds and you know a few other bits and pieces and it just felt really good you know, for, for Mila to be able to go out and eat the dirt without worrying about the council having just hit it with the latest dose of Roundup. And all, it's just all these little things started stacking. And, and for us, at least, with a new daughter, the idea of what does health look like? What does a good way of living look like? It was a recalibration. Like, I never thought about this stuff to, to a large degree at all, really. I mean, if you had have told me even three years ago that I'd own cows... <laughs> <laughs> and I'd have you at my place <laughs> talking about heifers and steers and electric fences mm. um, and uh, you know big uh, big pits full of cow shit. Mm. I would have I would have called you mad. <laughs> so Jindabyne, to a large degree, was a real spark of that earthing outside of an urban mm. an urban area, and it was immensely regenerative to use your word. And I grew up on a yacht, so my, my, my mum, who you've met, and my dad, my dad was in the Navy for seven years. He, he retired and built our boat and we sailed around the world for seven years. So from six to 14, I grew up on the water. Uh, so not, and we circumnavigated the, the world. So I'd been to 40. Just, just as your family? Yeah, or was it, yeah. myself, my mum, my dad. Get out of so here. So 40-foot yacht. And so that took seven years. I'd been to 46 countries by the time I was 14. Came school, back to high schooling? school. Schooling? What was school? Distance education. Okay. So we'd tell 
there's a group, I don't know if they still exist, called DEC, Distance Education Centre in Australia, and we'd basically tell them, oh, we're going to be in Cairo in two months. And so they'd send a big box to the, to the harbour master at Cairo. We'd give them an, ad- an address and pick up the box and I'd fill in the schoolwork and send it back and get graded. And by the time we came back, I was a year ahead uh, of the, the traditional <laughs> Curriculum. So that was an Aussie Aussie um, Aussie mob, yeah, mob. And, and they did it a lot. Uh, it was an offshoot of School of the Air, so a lot of you know big stations and things like that, where kids are you know eight hours from their from their next door neighbour um, used to use it a lot. And uh, we were one of the first that they adapted it for us um, being international. So, so I guess you could even say, to a large degree, my regenerative journey probably started there because. While it wasn't my adventure per se, it was dad's and mum's. I went along for the ride, but I, I guess it laid a install base, it laid a foundation or a paradigm that, you know, the world is small and accessible and, you know, there's not many barriers to life if you, you know, choose to go and have an adventure. Well, I was going to say, that's, that, that sets up a, a wonderful um, paradigm or a wonderful um, Attitude for adventure, doesn't it? With no, with well, I mean, there are probably obviously family boundaries with behaviour and those sort of things. But in terms of where is home, what are we doing, where are we going, languages we're exposed to, mm. foods, um, you know, I guess d- danger in a way as well. You know, that's that's uh, you know, sailing the high seas. That's um, that clearly, well, I assume, had a had a big impact on your general attitude to life i assume so as well it's hard to say because i'm me you know i'm on the on the there's water, no twin. There's on the no water i'm swimming in no, there's no there's no control group <laughs> um are you sure <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll get to that I should probably follow up with my dad on that <laughs> uh, but uh so i guess that's a that's a perspective and i love the story of how it all started because my my dad when he was still working in the navy went to mum uh, sorry went to my mum's mum my nana and was just like, I can't quite put my finger on it, you know, the, the typical bit of an existential crisis. He's like, work's good, family's good, something's, something's missing. So a dog, dog with shoe. Dog has got shoe. Do you want to save it? No. Nah, sure. Right. It's gone. Can you pause this? Oh, I keep going. We'll cut it out. <laughs> cut it out. Or I'll chat. Or I'll, All I'll right. do some... <laughs> I, might make, I might make a nugget of that time. <laughs> Oi! Classic. There you go. <laughs> oh, there you go, listeners. That's it live. We don't stop for anyone. Um, dog. I'm just going to make a note there. Dog shoe. Dog shoe. Dog shoe. <clears throat> we might not choose to chop that out, though. I, like, I kind of like that. Is it, brought it back. Oh, you brought them inside. Now, I'm, I've got my hat on my You've boots got, out there. I'll get them, too. You reckon? Yeah, that'd be good for them. Because I, I may not see mine getting carted off to the grass there somewhere under a tree. Because it is raining, you might hear a, bit, a little bit of pitter patter in the background. We have um, done our best to sort of mitigate some of that, but um, well done, mate. Thanks, mate. Let's see it. Yeah. So, yeah, dad, so, dad so man. Nana said, uh, "What would you do if you weren't afraid?" Cool. And he just went, and, and to Dad, Lieutenant Commander in the Navy, you know, back in the day when the Navy was the Navy, um, said I'd sail around the world, pack my family up and go. Because he was, he was in the Navy at that point. He in had the, responsibility in the Navy, and he had a career. In and, the Navy building boats. Well, he'd been in for 25 years, so he got in when he was 15. Yeah. So he'd already sort of done his stint, if you like. Mm. So he was able to retire a few years later on a pension, build our boat, off we went. But that idea of what would you do if you weren't afraid, I think, is a mm. – and that led directly to that adventure is um, probably a good catalyst for any kind of regenerative mindset or paradigm or incubator. When did you first hear that story, That you know, that question? Oh, and, and if so, no, did maybe, it resonate with maybe, you at the time? Maybe, no, yeah, so maybe 10 years ago and, and no, not so much. Didn't quite understand it. I think I think you've got up and around the block a few times, had a few blood noses before it really makes sense. Because I think when you're young and you're a kid, there's no, uh, there's no baggage, there's no anchors to have to cast off, there's no things to let go of. It's all just new. So I go here, I go there, no big deal, but... 
you know, as you start to build a career and, you know, an identity starts to manifest to just go off and do something else, there's, you know, a fear of loss, a fear of uncertainty. There's a comfort zone that's been built that potentially isn't, well, wasn't there for me, I suppose, when I was, when I was younger. <clears throat> it's a good one, isn't it, that the, um, you, I guess, everyone's journey is different and, and everyone's attitude to fear, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, wonderful quotes about how to deal with it. One, I love, I don't know if Tony Robbins actually coined it or not, but he said the antidote to fear is gratitude, hmm. you know, and that really resonates. I heard that some years ago and I was doing some of his stuff. Um, but that to me, and I think that kind of makes sense for it, you know, whether it's general fear, just, you know, some are being anxious or particular fears, I think that there's there's something in that. Um, that's that's um, your nan. That's yeah, life. wise old, Lo- yeah, wise totally, old bird. Totally. Yeah, yeah. And so, cast off the anchor. Yeah. Off you went. Fear cast aside as well. You oblivious to, I guess, what was ahead. You had no benchmark, as you said. You're talking about the boat. The boat. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think Dad had any fear around it. Dad was a highly skilled, mm. you know, yachtsman, skipper, navigator, builder. Like so, you could. You know, Handy he kind of guy. knew what he was doing. Yeah. Um, I think, from Mum's perspective, certainly that's a big step into the unknown. She was a hairdresser at the time, and you know the whole the whole bit. So, you know, less kudos to him, but huge kudos to her mm. for the for the trip and the adventure. I think. Don't get me wrong. You know, Dad's got mad mad skills to be able to pull it off. But in terms of facing fear, it, it would have been Mum having the courage to be able to go. Yeah, let's. Let's do this. Um, and me, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know any different. So I'm mm. just going along for the ride at that point. So fourteen, fourteen, you fourteen got, got back high school. <coughs> yeah, yep. And was it was it purposely at fourteen because it's like, oh, we better get him into school now. I was starting to get the shits. I was starting. You, to, well, who were your mates? It, well, that's the problem. You'd meet kids and then you'd leave them and meet them and leave them and meet them and leave them. Mm. And uh, you know, I was kind of putting on a bit of pressure, going, I'd like to go to school and have some friends and live a bit of a, a normal life and, and I think that started to sort of sink in. I mean, it had been seven years. It's a long time. Yeah, seven years is a long time and, you know, I, yeah, I'm seeing these shows about high schools on TV and stuff and you just kind of, you, I mean, you always want what you can't, can't have. Every kid in high school would have been like, well, give me a, a boat and wrecks to dive on and, you know, fish to hunt and, you know, tropical islands to, to play on. It doesn't matter where you are, I think it, everything normalizes and, and you want what's different, but I just wanted friends and I wanted that social life and I wanted to be able to hang out with people for more than, you know, two or three weeks before we went our separate ways. Did that <clears throat> create a pattern in your life like that kind of – that's a very impressionable time, 7 to 14 in the world of biodynamics or Steiner or, yeah. you know, sort of um, that kind of world. That's um, – that's that's a that's a pretty important foundational period of one's life. Do you think? And I'm no expert in that. I, I reference it often, and I appreciate that those seven year get you know groupings um, have different influences on people. Do you know enough about that to you know appreciate or understand you know, how that might have might have played out? Yeah. So I've done a fair bit of work on this because um, I suppose just in terms of willingness to connect. So a quite shy by nature as a, as a default. Mm. Um, so more introverted by nature, tend to have very small groups of very good friends. Um, but I don't tend to miss people, mm. right? Like if someone, if I, like I've got mates that I haven't seen in many, many years, not even a little bit of, oh, I miss them, et cetera. But when I see them again, it's like, we, yeah. like we'd never met, uh, like we never, never sort of left. So yeah. I can, I guess I can move on from... Um, people and locations quite quite easily, uh, potentially a little too easily historically, if that makes sense. <laughs> Do we want to go there? No, I don't know. If it adds, <laughs> I don't know if it adds a lot to the not, to the story. And that's not a bad thing either. I mean, that's just the way. No, it's, it's just, just it's, it's it just who I am and and, yeah. and how it works. I don't think it's good or bad. It just it just is. But certainly in relationship. Mm. And in relationships, close relationships, mm. 
um, that could be an issue. I was often uh, often suggested that I was quite aloof or distant or you know name the name the adjective, which wasn't untrue. And I reckon there'd be plenty of um, uh, psychologists that would say that was a protective mechanism, you know. But 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 in in you know to, to know the history probably sheds more of a light on it. Well, it was absolutely a protective mechanism from this idea that you know people people leave or I leave people, you know, one or yeah. one or the other. And while it wasn't like you know my my father left me or something like that, it, but it was just we moved around a lot, and yeah. so that was just the nature of it. I don't think it's unusual. I don't know. There's lots of lots of military kids and what have you move around. Oil and gas kids move around. Police kids, right? So you know, it's not particularly novel. It's just how I grew up. It's your life, mate. And um, so high school, where 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 we where where did you settle? Where was where did you? Yeah, Sunshine Coast, up in Queensland. Yeah. So I went to Maroochydore High School. Yeah, which was interesting. I'm very, <laughs> very famous Maroochydore High School. Is it? No, I'm just saying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> Maroochydore has its, you know, its uh, gateway to the the uh, Sunshine Coast, isn't it? Yeah, I don't. I don't think you would have called it a gateway to anywhere <laughs> back in '98 when I graduated. No. Um, uh, eventful, uneventful. Mate, Was just it hard um, to settle back. You know, yeah, bit of a bit of the odd kid out. Um, I went from having conversations with adults my whole life mm. to conversations with dickheads. Um, you know, young. Still, clearly, still are. Clearly, still are. Uh, no, I found I found the first couple of years of high school very challenging. Mm. I found the politics of high school asinine, um, and I didn't understand. There's surfers and there's homies and there's skegs and skegs are different to surfers and there's skaters and there's full, and there's all these little sex, and uh, and I just came in as this kid off a boat going, hey, like mm. let's just be friends and. You know, were you cool for a while because, or, or the whole way through because you were so different? No, there, no, no, no. Different kids don't tend to be no. cool. <laughs> no, I just thought that maybe with such an unusual no. um, background and history and things to talk about. No, no. It, well, that's not the way the cookie crumbled. No. For for me, it was the opposite. It was bullying and you know yeah. being kind of ostracised a little bit. So the main thing I think at high school was to put that to bed, and uh, I guess reorient myself to the fact that I suppose high school didn't think we were going to talk about this I suppose high school was my very first experience of not being accepted for just who I was Mm. you show up there's another boat with a kid on it doesn't matter if you're a few ages different or whatever it is or you know a different nationality or a different language or whatever it is it's just hey great let's find the common ground and get up to some mischief Uh, whereas there was a whole other game going on at high school that took me quite a while to get my head around. Um, and on a few different levels too. I mean, if it's you and someone else that are, you know, for two weeks at somewhere when you're on the boat, that's mm. gone to one-on-one. You're in a school, it's you and yeah, the rest it's of a whole, It's a whole other, it's a whole layers, other dynamic. A whole other dynamic. So, no, I was, I was bullied for a while and a bit of a loner. I had a, I had a small group of mates, but, um, yeah, and I had, to, I had to learn how to not get bullied. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, and that was great. Then I got into surfing. That was a regenerative journey in itself, and that just got me straight back to, I guess, what I knew, which was the ocean and uh, and the rhythm of nature. And that was uh, that was a big reset. And all of a sudden, with surfing, and uh, <laughs> knocking a few kids out, um, all the all the bullying went away, and I skated through the the next couple <clears> of years because you you were fit and you were confident, or is that what you mean by knocking kids out? No, I actually had to knock a couple of the bullies out. Yes, that's what I mean. Yeah. But what gave you, what, oh, was, the, what so, was the point at which you went, actually, you know no. what, I'm not going to put up with this So shit I came, came home with a black eye and Dad took me to a martial arts dojo. Sweet. And the guy, uh, the guy saw my black eye and he said, I'll teach you everything that we can, but you're not allowed to use it for at least nine months. And that was the deal. And I said, okay. And to nine months, pretty much on the day, one of the guys came up and picked on me and he never picked on me again after that. I... Uh, and his mate saw that and didn't do it either. Everyone saw that. Yeah, yeah well. <laughs> word spread pretty quick. <clears throat> Holy shit! Yeah, right. yeah. This meek, this meek little kid uh, with glasses. Mm. Um, 
Yeah. Did you have a growth spurt later? Because you're a reasonably tall sort of fella. Yeah, no, it's a reasonable size. I just I didn't have an aggressive bone in my body. Mm. Uh, I still don't. I'm not a I'm not a particularly aggressive person, but pushed. Mm. What do you do? Snap. But good on your dad for having the initiative to do that. And I think most dads would probably go, you know, so. what do you do here, you know? Well, you take him to a dojo, you put some gloves on yourself and he wasn't a, he wasn't a fighter. And, you know, he came up from 15 in the Navy. So he'd right? have to look after himself there. Right, and so to, 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 yeah, so, you know, talk about an alpha breeding ground, mm-hmm. you know, for him, to, for him to kind of organise himself the way he did, becoming a lieutenant commander, he would have kind of had kind of had that pathway there where is he real and he was working you know 16 hours a day after we got home just to kind of keep a roof over the head so probably didn't have a lot of time to guide me so i Mm. I suppose he thought oh well chuck you in the ring and you'll be all right so just on that one i'm interested because i lila is 11 and you know i've been trying to get her to jujitsu and a few things when she was little she did a bit of that sort of stuff and loved it and was good at it. I was, I was a good wrestler when I was a kid. And um, so she kind of got those genes. But I'm kind of thinking, how do I focus that? Because for me, it's really important. They're yeah. young, you know, she's a female, you know, like the world is a big, scary place, you know. Mm. And so to sort of give them the, the grounding. And so what was your, what was your modality? What was the, what was uh, the type of Zendo Kai. Art? Zendo Kai. Yeah, it's an abstract one. It's just a, apparently a form of street fighting. I don't know. I didn't keep it up. Yeah. Um, but, but, like, if you got the shit with me now, could you, like, just, like, wah? No. No, you, you wouldn't have it in you? No, not, not that it was me, but, I mean, it, would these things just come back? Because I'm no, I've got no... I don't think so, no. It's fine, you have to keep up with it. Yeah, no, I, there would, there would if, if there was ten blokes, I wouldn't take the bet that I'm a better fighter you're than gonna, any of the time. No, I'd get the 308. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, now, school... As you said, a regenerative journey of sorts with, with surfing and a, then a, I guess a redefining of one's place mm. in the world, mm. in the social structure. Um, what happened next? Uh, I went partying for about two years down in Sydney, Sydney Olympics. I worked in bars for a while just mm. for the fun and adventure and social life. Straight out of school? Straight out of yeah. school, yeah. Okay. Straight out of school. Mm. Worked in bars. Does mum know about this? <laughs> Got the shits with that <laughs> after a while. I say that because Gloria's just in the couch beside us. <laughs> and, uh, She's had it all before, I'm sure. Decided I wanted to learn how to make money and so went to university, ironically. Um, so came back to the Sunshine Coast, started a boat cleaning business to make some money. Actually, I restarted it because I was running that business through high school. Anyway, it's another story, but... Um, so cleaning, cleaning boats, doing underwater search and recovery, finding people's glasses and winch handles and shit that they've lost and making good money doing that. Did my first year of uni, business degree, all that kind of stuff, finished second in my class, but had learned nothing in that first year of uni that I could apply to any of my business. And I had one guy that I was sort of paying as a subby, I suppose, et cetera. And I'm just like, this is all theoretical. It's all crap. None of my lecturers had, I mean, this wasn't Stanford, right? This was the University of the Sunshine Coast. So none of my lecturers had actually run businesses as, as other than them being, you know, um, lecturers, themselves. really, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so decided to quit, started a business with a mate of mine, Dan. We went to high school together. Promoting, promoting events and conferences and sales and marketing that we sort of picked up along the way, and and that became, I guess, the genesis for all the all the, you know, the uh, the, <laughs> the 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 sequence of evolution that's led to what is now Dent and Key Person of Influence and the the business accelerators that we do. So it's kind of been a a thematic from about there, but basically started my first business at, at twenty one. My first real business at 21 and, and scarred it from In there. Brizzy? Uh, we were in Melbourne. Oh, Melbourne. At the time. Yeah. yeah. And then, so I stayed in Melbourne, Dan went to Brizzy and we started running events and con- conferences in, in Brisbane and Melbourne. So yeah. we had we had a house in Brisbane, an apartment in Melbourne that we used as essentially the offices. And then we expanded to Sydney and then we did Australia. And why that? Why events in Mar- Like what was the, what was the hook there? Well, both... 
Dan and I had an interest in personal development, business development. You know, we both joined Amway literally for the tapes, for the content. And I love and still love learning stuff. I love learning from people that have got the T-shirt, if you like. Can, can I just um, jump into that one? Who are your some of your um, favourite ones of those guys or girls? You know, the ones that – who are the tapes you listen to, you know? Oh, the tape was so I love a lot of the Tony Robbins stuff. One of the guys, Mike Harris, we promoted, um, built and sold three billion dollar businesses. People probably wouldn't have heard of him, but he was a UK fella. Um, wrote a book called Find Your Light Bulb. Um, you know, you talk to someone who three times in a row built a billion dollar business, two two banks and a telco. In, just interesting humans like that. We we tried to find people that were not your traditional Tony Robbins kind of people, mm. um, people that are a little bit more under the radar but had these wonderful kind of credentials and, and track record. But um, oh, So you were listening to those tapes and going, I want to promote that guy? Is that how it works? Yeah, well, that's how it started. And then, you know, often we couldn't access those people or they were too expensive or they had a whole litany of criteria. And so then we started finding people that didn't have a promoter but had a great skill set and we started working with them. Because you've got to keep in mind, we're 22 years old. Mm. Um, and so, you know, we, we would find people that had a, something to say and or a product or a service. I mean, we'd sold mattresses, we sold promoted mattresses, promoted DVD vending machines. Like we were just entrepreneurs looking for an opportunity at the time, just getting used to marketing, getting used to advertising, getting used to sales, getting used to running a running a business. And then we got good in finding these people that didn't have an audience but had a skill set or a product and we would come in and build their audience and build their profile and build their positioning in their industry and we'd run marketing and run ads and you know, often they'd write books as a result of us kind of shaping them and, and working with them and, you know, their brand and influence would grow and we'd put more bums on seats. And at the time we were just taking a clip of the ticket yeah. and we were really helping them build out this brand infrastructure that we weren't even getting paid for. It would become quite valuable in hindsight, but at the time we were just helping them you know, build their influence, and in if you like, this is before Facebook, this is before Instagram, this is you know, spending a quarter of a million bucks a, a month on traditional ads in newspapers and you know, old old school <laughs> fax broadcasting. Um, but it, it taught us the craft of sales and marketing and and running a business, and then behind the scenes, it, it taught us a thing or two about how to position someone in their industry to to pull a crowd. And was that a bit of trial and error? Or was it like you, there was a recipe you found? Or was there a sort of well, mix of everything? Yeah, it was all trial and error at the start. Mm. I mean, we uh, we also spent about a year working in, a, in another business that was, I guess, we became a competitor for them. So learned a bit of the craft, did a bit of an apprenticeship. And so, that, yeah, there was, a, there was a formula, you know, you run ads, you get people in a room, you present a message, you give people a next step. There was a simple sort of structure there that really hasn't changed today to a large degree. Um, and... The business just grew and, and it grew fast. You know, we grew to about ten million in revenue in three years. So we're twenty four years old, twenty five years old, controlling about ten million worth of sales a year. And then it all blew up and went to zero. And then we, you know, started again. And then we expanded and went to the UK. And then the GFC hit. And you know, so there's a there's a big convoluted. How does gym. something how does something something blow up to go to zero? Well, can we? Is that? Oh, just did. So. We were we went from you know selling you know courses and training sort of seminars that people might spend twelve hundred fifteen hundred two thousand, and then there was a company called Imagine Essential Services that was selling licenses to be able to go into a business and reorganize all of your you know your power your gas your telecommunication your stationery and get you with different suppliers etc mm -hmm. it was this great way for the licensee to make trailing income it's a great way for the business owner to save costs and so we started promoting that and everything just you know expanded really really quickly it was super possible uh super um, profitable there mm -hmm. was a charismatic leader that was great at talking about it and it turns out it was just one giant big con yeah uh, and, and, you know, we audited it as well as we could. It was in our license agreement that we were just a marketing company, et cetera. But 
it was horrible. It was just, a, we were, yeah, 20, 24, 25 years old. The whole thing came out as a giant scam, giant Ponzi scheme. The guy has become a serial con artist. He's been in jail the whole bit. We didn't know. We're, you know, 23, 24, starry-eyed, thought we were doing the right thing. You know, we checked with all these different people and he had group licensees and licensees and surrounded by 20, 25 odd people that were fans saying this stuff worked great. It was a really well put together pile of bullshit. Come on. And so we were the marketing engine that promoted that. So that in, we got entwined in that and, uh, and that fell apart. And, you know, knowing that you'd been involved in essentially liberating about $10 million from people over, you know, the course of a couple of years, pretty horrible feeling. And so, while there was no, you know, malice or nefarious intent whatsoever from our perspective, you certainly pause a little bit and go, whoa, re recalibrate, recalibrate this. And that was when we decided that we were never going to promote or sell anything that we didn't have control and ownership. And of. a deep, deep understanding of. And a deep understanding of, yeah. We, we just we, we just weren't going to promote anything of anyone else's. We were going to promote stuff that was ours. So if, if anything went wrong, we could fix it. Um, and that was, you know, it's interesting. You, you look back at the lessons that you learn and the, and, the, and the blood noses that you take and it informs, you know, and it builds. And without that, you know, we wouldn't have had the imperative to build a great product that was head and shoulders above anything else out there in the market. You know, you might have been tempted to cut corners and to, you know, focus on revenue or profit over the quality of the product and your reputation. And, and, you know, so having that lesson so acutely demonstrated and so violently demonstrated and so horrendously demonstrated early, you know, just put a huge bias on insane quality product you know the, the one the one thing that people will never be able to say is that it was a shit quality product or mm -hmm. that the product didn't have deep integrity so that was a hard lesson to learn but, but one that obviously stood you in good stead that created the or new template for integrity and, and and, and mm -hmm. criteria mm -hmm. so a challenging situation was actually life-changing always yeah, as they, <laughs> as they <laughs> tend to be. Well, as one yeah. hopes. Well, yeah. I mean, because sometimes, you know, people go through, well, I mean, challenges occur to people and they deal with them, but not everyone learns from them, you know, I think. Um, I don't think. I mean, I try to, and sometimes I struggle to, to see the light and the benefit of these things, but it, you, you're absolutely right. It's We've all got our blind spots, and mm. I think there's something about... Um, there's something about things that are acute. It's very hard not to learn a lesson out of something that happens that's so acute. Mm. Right? The stuff that's hard to learn lessons from is just the grinding sort of mediocrity or the grinding issues or the grinding problems that are just kind of elongated and dispersed over time so you start to normalise them. You know, the human brain is really good at kind of just getting used to shit, the painted room scenario. Um, you know, you get used to a painted room pretty quickly, whereas... The, the acute experiences in life tend to be very easy to learn things from, whereas identifying the painted room that you're in mm. and uh, and learning from that is often the the, the trick. There's no mm. growth stimulant like pain, mm. um, as someone once said, mm. or many people experience. Um, what happened then? Don't know Re what we're talking about. Recovery. We're at zero. Here at a zero. Oh right. Then we um, so we rebuilt. We went back to our original model, which which worked, and we were able to control. We expanded to the UK, uh, and we were just promoting authors and speakers that we knew had credible products. And then the GFC hit, and it went to zero again. And you're um, in? Were you in London this day? London, London, yeah. London for two years. Yeah, we decided. A, we were, so we were twenty six, twenty seven. Yeah, twenty six at this point. Australia became a little bit small and potentially a bit jaded, just a bit like ugh. And you know, there is a larger marketable population inside the M twenty five in London than in all of Australia, and you don't have to travel. You know, so yeah. for us, it was a it was an opportunity. So we went there and. Um, you know, running events and conferences and 
you know, bouncing back to Australia a few times, but eventually it didn't make sense to do anything in Oz because it was just going off over there. We're doing really well. And then the GFC hit and, you know, we had about 15 or 16 on the team and we had a good brand and all this sort of stuff and it just... Um, and that was where we kind of got the bit of feedback that businesses fail but entrepreneurs don't fail. Like the mindset of entrepreneurship is learn, adapt, develop and while businesses will come and go it's like my daughter can be building lego and it'll fall apart and okay build it again she doesn't really take it personally whereas you know it's very easy to take a um a a broken business or a a business that's falling apart it's very easy to take that personally Mm -hmm. and so we took that quite personally but then had to learn to actually know we just we built it wrong um and the reflection and the hindsight was, well, how would the business have needed to be different to be resilient enough to have survived that? And whatever answers you come up with there are the key design features to build into the next business. And that became our current business, Dent. And, you know, with those print, more media, more technology, more digital, less local, you know, less human time intensive. So all of these things that we started building in and eventually teaching to to our clients through our through our accelerator programs, it meant when COVID came along, we were able to grow fifteen percent as opposed to you know many other people in our industry. I know went to the went to the wall. It was like COVID was the test for the model, the ultimate test for that model. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, part of the feedback we got back in the GFC is every seven to ten years. The market corrects somehow. Somehow the world comes up with a reason for for everything to go tits up. And, you know, historically it's financial. There's, there's, you know, the the, the stock market will correct or, you know, the the GFC or whatever. It it typically had been financial. Um, There hadn't been anything of, of substance historically like a pandemic with the kind of lockdowns and the rolling shenanigans that sort of went on around around all of that but and that affected businesses in a in a totally different way but the same things that would make a business or most businesses resilient against a financial collapse also make them resilient against you know a, a pandemic and lockdowns and and things of that nature and so not just were we in pretty good stead, but because we've been teaching this stuff to our clients for 10 years, they were in pretty good stead. And so that just helped our reputation. That it's like, oh, wow, here's this group of people that are doing really well. And there's a bit of success guilt um, in our community when everyone's going to the wall and there's all this sort of blood on the streets in the, in the middle of the pandemic, whereas a lot of our clients that are, were using more media, they were using more technology, they were you know, more diver- diversified, they had global products, et cetera, they were were resilient you know we had physios that they had to shut their physio practice down but they had global coaching mm-hmm. models that they were delivering that were bringing in a couple of hundred grand a year that could you know keep them going through it so while they took a hit the hit wasn't wasn't terminal there was kind of a a um what's the word segue into something else related to what they were doing they were already prepared for or had a well I guess more emphasis on what may have been a sideline thing became like whoa I can't I can't meet with people anymore well I'm finding that there are parallels to agriculture and, and to you know it's monocrops are bad you know, and in business if all you've got is a single product or service that's like a monocrop and it's bad and it's fragile um, and it's vulnerable um, and it's boring and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very similar um, paradigm. Whereas our approach, you know, the last sort of 10 years has been it's about the ecosystem and it's about having a product ecosystem. So if, you, if you're a heavily service-based business where you want to build a, a product line or a series of product lines, if you're a highly localized business where you want to have some, some, some digital products that you can sell anywhere in the world, if you're a, a digital-only business, you want to see is there some, is some ways you can just some deliver stuff in the real world. And just to create these, these hedges from the real world to the digital world, from local to global, and uh, having a whole variety for typically for a very consistent market or niche but having a variety of products and services in that ecosystem which not only is more profitable 
Um, not only does it allow you to serve more people depending on what stage of the journey it's in, but it's more resilient depending on what happens in the world. You'll have a part of your business that's still working that you can put more energy into if something, whatever it's going to be, happens. Um, you know, so having a diverse product ecosystem, service ecosystem in your business seems to be, from what I'm learning at least about about agriculture and regen ag and all that sort of stuff is that it's the, the diversity is the key and the diversity actually protects and makes it more resilient and it doesn't need as many inputs and you know it's a it's actually a really beautiful parallel or metaphor or allegory if you like between the two well, there's no doubt that um, the more diverse a business is or biodiverse a farm is um, it's able to adapt it's more, you know, there's more things, more, more tools in the toolbox and more opportunity to adapt, you know, greater, greater breadth of, of, um, of, of options. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so that's been our focus for a decade is essentially helping businesses build a better business. And that's become our thing. And it's become accidentally, I suppose, it's become my passion. You know, my dad's, um, my dad's vehicle for freedom and adventure was the boat and still is. He's floating around in the Philippines on a, on a yacht. Mine was business, um, but similar concept, you know, the, a vehicle that is a, a, a sandbox for personal development. Um, you know, nothing will, <laughs> nothing will um, force personal evolution more than running a business and, as you well know, hiring people and doing the whole stuff. I'd imagine it's sort of like a farm. Um, you said to me some months ago, I think that because we, we talked about it this a lot, and you know, the kind of you're mentoring me in some ways in creating a, a more resilient business, and 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 I certainly you've, you've been wonderful in kind of um, highlighting the parallels with business resilience and, and agricultural farming resilience. And obviously, farms are a business, and there she comes. There she comes. But um, you said to me some months ago that, you know, one of the comments you made was when COVID hit, you know, what you had been teaching other businesses, you kind of then had to do yourself. You know, like, I guess at that time, your live events. Yeah. So, I mean, we were, so pre-COVID, over. pre-COVID, <clears throat> we were still running live events, but we had, you know, 55 people on the team. We'd made two or three acquisitions of different businesses. We had staff in... 12 different time zones, three quarters of those staffs weren't in physical offices, we're already using Zoom and Slack and Dropbox. And Mm. so we already had the infrastructure to be able to pretty quickly uh, switch to, is that? We might have shut those windows, what do you reckon? Oh yeah. You reckon? Just still. Yep, hang on. Looking for more information to assist your regenerative journey? Come join Charlie and his guests around The Kitchen Table, an online community of supporters with exclusive access to the Regenerative Journey interview transcripts, live online Q&A sessions, a chance to engage with other like-minded people and more. Go to www.charliearnett.com.au forward slash The Kitchen Table and we look forward to sharing a yarn with you. Now let's get back to this week's episode. Yeah, it's a bit up. Little. Um, yeah, so you already had, inf- you had the infrastructure. We already had the infrastructure. Yeah. And, um, you know, the beauty was is no one had a choice. No. You know, people, had, you know, our, our clients, it was like, well, we're not allowed to do physical events. We're doing it online. And ha- had we have done that prior to sort of the mandates and the, the kind of government saying you're not allowed to meet gather. with people and gather mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff, I, I don't think people would have swallowed the... I'm just not doing physical events anymore. We're just going to go online. Mm. But because the, the hand was forced, there was a instant acceptance, I suppose, and it was, wasn't just us. It was happening to everybody, right? So there was this kind of like paradigm of, oh, okay, this is, this is what's happening now. Mm. And, uh, and like that, it's just stopped. Not a drop. Pretty much. Um, it happens up here, doesn't it? Just Bang. on and off. Uh, and 
people loved it. Yeah. It was like all of a sudden we don't have to commute. All of a sudden we can have mentors from wherever they are in the world. We have clients from wherever they are in the world. So our business went up because all of a sudden people from Singapore and you know, Mumbai and all sorts of different places that weren't going to fly into Sydney or Brisbane or Melbourne or London or, you know, we had some physical hotspots where we would focus our events and conferences um, and sort of business trainings that really excluded anyone that was, wasn't, you know, that was more than an hour and a half drive mm. from there. I mean, we had some people that were committed that would, you know, drive five or six hours in or, or fly in from a, you know, a remote area or whatever it was, but they were the outliers, whereas all of a sudden, you know, so long as someone had an internet connection, they were a, they were a client. Oh. So we will never go back to physical events now because we'd piss off three quarters of our clients because they're from all over the place. Well, that was my next question is, you know, what what – what has changed forever, you know? What 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 is what forever is a long time. Um, <laughs> but, but what has changed in the medium to long term? Well, well no, 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 so so end of. So one of the things that my dad taught me that I think is very wise is you got to sell the weather you've got. So a skipper's not going to. I mean, they can make plans for medium to long term, but if the weather changes, react to the weather, right? Um, and, and so that's sort of my that's sort of my approach, uh, and and it's more if you kind of go up a level and think the weather's always changing, right? But what are some of the things that are constant? Well, some of the things that are constant is if I've got a boat and I've got sails and I've got navigation equipment, I can sail the weather I've got quite comfortably, right? And it's like oh that winch is broken and it doesn't oh we'll fix the winch and then we can it's kind of like reverse engineering that in terms of what does the business need to look like to be able to weather whatever happens, right? So for now, given the weather, it doesn't make sense for us to run any kind of physical events and our clients prefer the online events. They're getting better results faster. And instead of being big, long days, they're sort of two and a half hour, which you've experienced sort of intensives, which is like, oh, there's one thing I can now go out and implement without the overwhelm. Because there's a lot of, you know, going down the permaculture rabbit hole and, you know, there's a, this huge... Um, uh, I guess fixation on first principles, right? And if you can get the first principles right, and what are the what are the design elements that you're looking at putting in at the start, can make a huge difference. And so when you think about doing a physical event, well, you're not going to do a physical event for two and a half hours. It doesn't make sense to get a venue and get banners and get AV and get fly in a speaker for two and a half hours. You're going to do it for a day or two days. And so just some of those layerings of like, why are we doing one and two day conferences? It's like, oh, because the setup's such a pain in the ass and the infrastructure is such a pain in the ass. Whereas when all of that's gone and all you need someone to do is sit, sit down in front of their computer, it's like you can really reimagine how you deliver learning and content and, and, and information. And so that reset has allowed us to go all the way back to first principles and say, okay, how do we do this even better given the new rules of the game? Um, so to then go back to a less efficient way of doing it at no. this point doesn't make sense. I can't predict what would cause us to do that. Um, what about the... Um, I mean, one one thing that in the farming community, I was part of a number of different farming groups. One was RCS Australia, who, who I did a lot of training with. And one of the wonderful things, and this is going back 15, 16 years, 17 years, was three times a year, farmers, some isolated, some not, you know, would, would gather together yep. at a conference centre and powwow and speakers and activities and exercises and board, kind of board meetings and, you know, flesh stuff out. Yep. That for me was a was was a, you know a sense of community um, and and opportunity to share and just changing the patterns of mm. thinking and it was a really important part of my growth um, as an individual and as a farmer and a business owner was that connection. Mm. So I'm not arguing the point by any means, but I guess I'm thinking what what what's the the consequence of of the people potentially um, of that not being so, I mean, anyone can gather in a group and someone can organise a conference, but if that's not necessarily the go-to thing, I guess, what are we going to lose with this new way of doing business? Yeah, so we had to think about that and we decided what are we here to do? 
what is our job as an organization? We specialize in helping uh, leaders of established businesses build their brand, transform their product model, position themselves as their industry, you know, the book, key person of influence, all that. Like when, when you, um, when you need to put a nail in, you, you go get a hammer, right? When you need to build your brand in your industry as a, as a business owner, you come to us. Now, we could keep expanding out and go, oh, maybe we create a magazine and we could do annual retreats and, you know, da, 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 and let's, let's be in the business of community now. And you start creeping out and it's like, okay, well, it's a hammer and it's a this and it's a that and it's, a, it's another thing of which there are many, many groups and organizations that also do that. Yeah. And when we started talking to a lot of our clients that were our really successful clients, they're like, I've got friends, I've got communities, I've got places I can plug into, I go to a personal development conference or a course, etc. But there really isn't much that does what we do. And so we decided to focus insanely on that thing and to do it really well. And yeah, we had some people say, wouldn't it be great for us all to, to get together? And look, one day... We absolutely will, but we're not going to do it when some people are going to be excluded because of their medical status or where they are in the world or can't get on flights or, you know, potentially if I live. Like, my dad still can't get here to meet his daughter, a granddaughter, because he doesn't know if he's going to get, be able to get back to the Philippines based on all the, you know, the, the policies and what have you around, around COVID. And just while there's still that, I guess, threat of... Um, that threat we just we just want to be consistent with everybody in the same way and we don't want to create a scenario where a bunch of people are left out um, because of where they are or you know the, the choices they've made yeah and the rules of gatherings or venue policy or that sort of stuff yeah all that it's just too hard and yeah. and you know um the 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 powers that be now have a template to be able to just shut everything down on a whim and ostensibly be rewarded by it like people seem to love it and that's a huge business risk right <laughs> and, and we don't we don't want to sit there and have an event coming up in three months that costs a huge amount of energy and resources yeah. to put together and then oh, all of a sudden you know the the next uh, yeah. the next wave comes out so hopefully this all settles down everyone learns their lessons we look back over the last couple of years and go oh that was a bit that was a bit full on we might uh, we might temper the way we handle this next time but until such time, we don't want to add any additional business risk for the sake of you know a, a conference. Given that, we can we can put nails in one after another, doing exactly what we're doing with no risk whatsoever. Yeah, no, that that makes perfect sense. You, that's not your you know your 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 core business is as you said you know building brands and and people and the entrepreneurial skills, not building a community for them. So you just mentioned then... Um, well, I should also say yeah. communities build within our ecosystem. Yeah. And we've got a hyper-engaged um, Facebook group. Everyone's always catching up for dinners and meeting yeah. people and doing all that stuff in there. So it throws off community. We just make very sure that we know what our core business is. And it's producing key people of influence, not you know, getting people in a room so they can meet each other, considering if they want to meet each other, they, they meet each other anyway. You mentioned before um, about mandates and government. I don't think you used the word overreach, but maybe that's your, your mention. You said people love it. What, what did you mean? Well, there's just a, it seems to be a huge amount of, of public and media support for, mm. for you know, these, these measures. Um, you know, Western Australia, the Premier still gets a huge amount of kudos from his constituency around uh, essentially turning Western Australia into its own isolated country. And I, so, okay. I read today that he, he's, he'd he been quoted as saying it was an experiment. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> I've, I've stopped. I've stopped watching the media. <laughs> I've stopped. I've stopped listening. It's a. It's a. It's a new. It seems to be just a. Um, you know, just drama. part of the, part of the cycle now. It's a bit of a drama, but um, but certainly it was a drama that had a huge impact on our business and on our life for a for a long time. And so, getting back to here, Glenn, hmm. in this wonderful sanctuary with the beautiful rain tumbling down, is and I, I guess you did allude to it before, or was, didn't so much allude to it. It was pretty clear this. This is your you being here now, being a, an owner or a steward of the landscape, is a response to 
to that? I don't like to think of it as a response to that. I think that would give it too much power. Mm-hmm. Um, I think life is bigger and broader to that. Um, you know, I think it's a response to the fact of, you know, growing up on a yacht connected to the land, uh, the ocean and the rhythm of nature. Mm. I think it's a response to being fixated through my my 20s and sort of somewhat early 30s with a real focus on money and finance and business and success and that young bull kind of let's go um, at the expense of everything else um, and really focusing on that. And I think it's a rebalancing back to what's meaningful, um, what's uh, regenerative, rejuvenative, what feels charming, what feels exciting and um, I love the ocean. I love surfing. I love spearfishing. I love doing. I love doing these things. But being on a boat in that constraint of space it is not my path. But this idea of land and my experience of reconnecting to the rhythm of nature and to the sound of nature and to its pulse and to its nuance is something that I find deeply meditative, regenerative, to use you, you know your word a few times, but there's just something very magnetic about it that was that is subtle. And that when I was, you know, in business in London, in Melbourne, in Sydney, on flights, in aeroplanes, you know, backwards and forwards, doing the whole thing, building the build, a bit building the business, doing the do, um, it it gets drowned out. It's like this subtle whisper that you can't hear at a rock concert. But when you get out of the rock concert and all of a sudden this subtle, subtle whisper starts coming back through and I think Jindabyne let us tap back into that subtle whisper and to be like, wow, this is very sublime in its energy and in its uh, healing nature, if you like. I haven't really articulated it. I haven't spoken about it to a great deal of, of people, but it's sort of in that in that line and so I would like to think that while COVID definitely got us out of Sydney so it was a catalyst I I wouldn't like to say that this is a reflexive response to that I would not want to give it that much power what is this farm and Jindabai to some extent with as you said that catalyst was what is it what 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 do what has it been and what does it feel like it's an antidote for Um, I think it's a bit of a, well, for me, it feels like it's a bit of an antidote to, well, complacency, perhaps, um, bit of an antidote to, I don't know what the word is, but, you know, living a, um, urban lifestyle, everything's outsourced, you know, you're really not responsible for anything. Um, not responsible for getting my food. I'm not responsible for getting rid of my rubbish. I'm not like all of those elemental um, life supporting, enhancing, you could argue, um, elements are outsourced to incredibly long supply chains that are being controlled and managed and operated by, you know, other people. And I don't have an issue with that. I don't have a problem with civilization, but. You know, when I went to Jindabyne and, you know, started going out and, you know, hunting my own meat for the first time and experiencing that connection to the earth and the cycles of the earth and, you know, having to spend eight hours out in the bush trying to tune into, you know, the natural environment to be able to be successful, it was, wow, okay, I'm, I'm bringing the supply chain all the, all the way back to, to me. And then extending that to our veggies and, you know, to be able to have a plate of food that we grew and we procured ourselves. I suppose me being able to come from working on whiteboards and strategy with business and digital and media and brand and all this sort of real cerebral stuff to then be able to come back and have that just earth, that earthed connection um, has been... Uh, healing, I think. 
I think it's been healing and I think it's created a bridge back to what it was like growing up in the elements and I feel like this is kind of my own expression of of that and it's a beautiful thing to be able to balance the digital and then come and stick my my feet in the dirt mm. it's pretty cool so I'm not quite sure how to articulate it yet but I know it's I know it's meaningful I know it's subtle and it feels very charming and it feels very charming for my daughter to be here and to be able to play in the dirt and be connected to nature. And, you know, she's going to be growing up um, knowing where her food comes from and she's going to be a part of growing her food and seeing how nature evolves. And um, I don't think human being, beings have been particularly thoughtful of <laughs> our environment i think our priorities have been elsewhere kind of like my priorities were elsewhere in my you know my 20s and 30s and so this is also potentially a bit of a reset and coming back to how do i live my life in a way that is in uh more alignment to principles and behaviors and you know ways of operating that are you could call it sustainable i guess or just respectful of planet and people it's um <clears throat> you mentioned earlier glenn that Sydney, I think it was Sydney, Bondi, maybe want to get out of there. So there was there was a, a push away from that. Yeah. And then through a series of different events and a catalyst and then a you know, drawn to here. It's a it's a it's a not uncommon situation where there's a and it's a it's it's really good that I, I believe it's good that that is a situation, is a push and a pull. You know, it's not like I don't want to be in Bondi or, or I don't want to be in the city, or I don't want to do something, I don't know where I'm going to go. And maybe that was there was a bit of that, like I actually don't know where I want to go to, but I just know I want to get out of here. That's one thing, but to know where you want to go or to be courageous enough to try something else um, is a wonderful thing because there's a push away and then there's a, a vacuum, there's gravity towards something else, which um, I think a lot of people understandably, probably may want to get out of the city, you know, may want to change their life. Mm. And I'm being reasonably general when I say that, um, but not knowing what to do. They know, well, they we know didn't know what to there. do. We, like, I, was, I wasn't sitting there in Bondo going, I want to, you know, I own want land. a farm on yeah. our own land. No, it was, it was way more, um, and, and in hindsight, knowing what I know now, having met Nico and, you know, Vedic meditation with you and all that sort of stuff, uh, it's seeking charm. And, you know, for us being in Bondi just didn't feel charming. There are a few things we could kind of rationalise and go, oh, because of this and because of that and because of the other, but it just didn't feel charming anymore. I'd lived that life. I'd done that life. Sarah had done that life. Like it was like tick. Um, no judgment against it. It's just I think we had kids and there was a reorganisation of values and then it was like, oh, Jindabyne pops up. No concept. It wasn't like, oh, we want to go and be snowboarding or we want to this or we want to that or even that we want to just not be here for COVID because we didn't know what was going to happen. It was just charming. It was like this feels like an adventure. Um, and you had, the courage, you had the courage to do that. Had the courage but also the means, gratefully. Yeah. Like, you know, COVID did force a shift to our entire business being online. We decided we were never going back very early mm -hmm. and that gave me the flexibility to not have to be in Sydney anymore and so you know all of those things allowed that step to happen yes had to have the courage to do it but would i have done it if it meant giving up my whole business and you know starting from zero <laughs> like no yeah. that that wouldn't have been charming that would have been you know i would have had to have been in a lot more pain i suppose um with mm. the life i was living which wasn't a bad life Mm -hmm. I was a clubby at the surf club. I was a driver trainer. I used to teach people how to drive the rubber ducks out through the surf at Bondi. You know, had a you had a great that, time. You cut around those red red budgie no, smugglers. Yeah. Mate. No, no, no. We stayed out of the budgie smugglers, but we had a good good <laughs> yeah, time. You did. I'm but sure I've seen. It's you. a good life, right? So, you know, I think that the the trick is sometimes being able to recognise that you're living a good life but still be able to identify those moments of charm, those moments of that feels like an adventure and just trusting that, you know, if in every sort of decision that you make, there's an element of charm, there's an element of adventure, there's an element of that pull, you don't need to know where it's going to go. I mean, again, leaving Bondi, 
if you had have said that well, this is going to end up with 30 acres and, you know, cows and Charlie Arnott having yarns with us about how to make big piles of shit. <laughs> um, yeah. That would have been a bridge too far. It would be like, no. And, and in fact, I probably would have rejected it because it was mm. so foreign still. It, it had to had to creep up on me. Had to be a journey. Talk about the farm, Glenn. Tell us what you're doing here. What's, what's I mean, you know, there may be some Mate, we activities have no, you want to tell people about. We have no idea. Yeah. We have no idea. Uh, we, we had a wonderful tour this morning. I had a wonderful yeah. tour. You've done it many a time, but I had a lovely, lovely look around before the rain or in, in between rain showers. So it's beautiful. It's So what is it, 30 acres, what would you call it? It would be three quarters paddock, grass, Probably more, really. Maybe more, right? Four fifths, yeah. quite a lot. It's interspersed with some some beautiful trees and some some fruit trees and a and a lovely stream with a couple of little little plunge pools and, and watering holes. So it's kind of like a big blank canvas. Uh, and our original intent was sort of a a permaculture regenerative paradigm, which is. How do we do this in a ecologically responsible way, right? We don't want to be, you know, pumping fertilizers into the ground. We want to, you know, have a circular energy system, nurturing the soil, growing food, growing, um, you know, some animals and doing it in a way that's beautiful and that, you know, when we show up and when others show up, it is regenerative it's restorative it feels like a bit of a sanctuary um and you know when i first drove onto the place it it felt like it had well it felt like that but it certainly has because quite a lot of it is still paddock and quite open and you know mode um you know the idea is not to maintain 15 acres of well 20 acres of grass and so it's what can we do with that and you know i think phase one is just get some grazing happening which you and i were and Luke were talking about and the crew in terms of how to set that up and then evolve it from there. We're going to get some chooks, we'll get some ducks, we'll get some geese, we'll get some guinea fowl, we'll get some, you know, maybe a couple of horses. Um, and then as that happens, we'll grow up the garden, we'll grow up the food forest, plant some trees, maybe an orchard here or there. Um, the idea is to keep it as a hobby, as as something to really Paul, me, and Luke owns a data centre, so it's a similar, very sort of cerebral, digital-type businesses and, and this idea of them being able to come out and fix a fence is very charming and compelling to me, right? That, that idea of being able to put a couple of hours a day you know, into the property and into the land is, is just a very, I, I don't quite have the word for it yet because it, it sounds so pedestrian. And if you had have told me, you know, five years ago, mm, fixing fences. It would be like, what the fuck's gone wrong? <laughs> With how do my, I get to that? How do I get to this? <laughs> um, whereas now it is, a, uh, it is a true delight to be able to look at that because I think, again, understanding some of the principles behind what we're trying to do and why we're building the fence and what that could become. And it's, uh, it's interesting. I've never owned any kind of land resembling this. It's always been you know, apartments and duplexes and things of that nature. Whereas this is like, wow, really stretching my my consciousness <laughs> out around what we could do because... What's a heifer? Do anything with what's a heifer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A lot of people don't know. No. And well, I what didn't know them? until till this morning. And, and I mean, I guess that's the, the beauty of it is that we don't know. But we're we're excited to find out. You know, we've got four cows roaming around at the moment and they seem to be all right. So, Well, I mean, I think that's a – and I've said it many times because it's true and it as, as, as it, you know, my experience is that not dragging previous farming paradigms into this new space is one of the biggest assets or the – you know, you're not dragging the liability of thinking, of legacy of, uh, you know – whether it's dad or grandfather or just mm. previous life experiences of farming. And now there's some benefit in that, but, but the um, just from experience and kind of knowing how to strain up a fence. But in terms of seeing, as you have expressed this morning, uh, an empty pallet, mm. and you see you, the, your questions this morning were fascinating for me um, because they were naive 
in a, in, a, in, a, in a lovely, wonderful, innocent way, which is like, you know what? People don't ask those questions enough, mm. you know, starting from scratch because that's, and that's, a, that's a great thing. You're curious. You want to know. Um, you're looking at it differently, and that's a, that's, a really, that's a really positive thing, and that's a real, real asset that you are standing at looking at this with a totally new, clear pair of eyes, different perspective, seeing it as it is essentially. You know? And I think seeing what I see in business, I see people that are doing it just wrong, like they're making it really hard for themselves, uh, and they're, they're struggling with trial and error, and you know they're not necessarily seeking any kind of best practice and they're not happy and and you know i try to apply that sort of logic to everything and go all right what does best practice look like um who's who's kind of living the life that we want to take that element from and model and how are they doing it and you know when you when we go to a farm or a property and they got big empty chemical tubs laying in a pile out the back and they're spraying shit everywhere and, and, you know, all these machines and, you know, diesel blowing out the back of tractors. It's like, mm, that doesn't that doesn't feel nice, doesn't feel charming. But then when you see people that don't really, oops, don't have any of that mm. and they've got this beautiful circular ecosystem running and the ducks are eating the, you know, the snail so you don't need that, you know, whatever it is, it's like, well, that feels lovely. Mm. And so how are they doing that? differently and, and kind of recognizing that and you don't have to go too deep down the rabbit hole to realize that there are some real fundamental principles and way of doing things that take you down a very very different path very very early on but it, it matters that i think the decisions that you make before you decide to go one way or another because they, they go off in very different tangents um so it would seem i love your and you said it before and you said it a number of times Previously, that you know, the, and I think you might have even put it in a few different contexts. Is that monoculture? Mm. You know, that the, the businesses when we're in, in agriculture, monoculture is not. Necess- it can be a highly productive system. The output can be very productive, but it's very intense. It's very high input. Uh, quality can be most often lacking. It's a yield based, commodity based kind of way of thinking, and it's very prone to disruption. If one of those elements, you know, the guy doesn't get here with the superphosphate in time or the urea costs, you know, like these, your depending, dependence on other things is as imperative for the whole system to work. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lack of sovereignty around that. And the way you kind of parallel that with business, you know, like a non-farm business, mm. you know, monoculture of a, we only do this. Yeah. I mean, I guess we're, there's... We're a plumber or we're a spark here yeah. and that's just all we do. I mean, I guess there's, there's that kind of other juxtaposed, you know, finding your niche. We do one thing, we do it well, that's a niche of sorts. So is that is that not a monoculture or what's the difference no. between no. niche um, and monoculture? Well, I guess the, the idea is you can have a very specific specialty, like we have a specialty, like I said before, we're a hammer for a nail. Right, we're not a, a giant tool shed that's kind of all things to all people, and yet we have a very diverse ecosystem of products and way in which that is delivered. Right, um, you know, we have books, we have podcasts, we have courses, we have you know one type of course here and another type of course there, and you know, there's a, there's a whole ecosystem of stuff that goes into it in the same way that I could imagine you know you might have, a, and this is out of my area of expertise, but you know you might have a duck egg farm. Mm. that is still relying on the biodiversity of the ecosystem to allow them to specialise in producing duck eggs, Mm. for example, which was just a video I saw recently. And that's showing the whole ecosystem that goes into making that work as opposed to just going, all right, bare concrete, duck eggs, how how do we do it? And so, no, it's not having a, from a business perspective, having a diverse product and service ecosystem and offering still really needs to be built on a very specific focus because you still Mm -hmm. need to be able to talk about it clearly and articulate what it is that you do um i guess what and what you produce it's just that the way you produce that might be a diverse tools or diverse um uh, array of 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 of, uh yeah i guess tools and and learnings or um yeah, as you say, the 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 environment, the 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 ecosystem. Yeah, has to so be diverse. so let's just make sure we're not getting caught into in semantics or parallels. But like, if I was a plumber, mm. I'd make sure a if I was a really good plumber, then I'd be looking at all right. Instead of just doing plumbing, how do we maybe also teach plumbing? 
Yeah. And how do we maybe teach bit plumbing businesses how to do better plumbing and how do we do that around the world? And then how do we have, so now we do plumbing, but we also teach plumbing and then maybe we also have, you know, we, we, we're involved in the curriculum at, uh, at TAFEs to be able to train apprentice plumbers and we're involved in that. Maybe I speak on plumbing in industry sectors in the industry um, but then I might also talk about business outside of that because maybe we do work on culture right because the way we differentiate our plumbing business is by having a culture because it's not about the plumbing it's about this so then maybe we can do some stuff around culture to them and all of a sudden we broaden what it is to to be a plumber, be a plumber. right but if anyone was to say what do you do I'd still say well I'm a plumber and we do plumbing but we do it at a whole bunch of different levels to a whole bunch of different sort of stakeholders mm. as opposed to I'm a plumber and I'm an arborist and I'm a, you know, essentially a handyman, yep. Yep. right, which starts to generalise back down again. No, fair call. Um, mate, we are God, I'm running out of time. Um, I've got a little, sex, little separate session for you, Glenn, I think I did mention it before, for our Patreon members. So we're gonna, we might slip into that pretty soon. Great. So we'll sign off here. Unless there's anything else that you'd like me to, any Dorothy Dixes you'd like, you'd like me to ask you? Is there anything you're burning? Well, I, don't burning? Know. I don't know what you're referencing with Dorothy <laughs> Dix. I think I'm showing my age <laughs> or you're showing yours. Um, <laughs> Setups. Got Setups. it. No, mate, I've just appreciated the, mm. the opportunity. Mate, good chats. And um, it's, I have to, um, thank Nico Plowman for the serendipitous meeting that we had at mm. his retreat last May, mm. um, his meditation retreat, because I'd, I had I had been actually given the um, KPI book, Key Person of Influence book, a number of times, and then I received it in the mail a couple of years ago because I did a two-hour session uh, that, as you guys, I guess, still do, do a two-hour sort of like a, you know, Teaser, if we can call it that. Yeah. So, um, had an entree, an entree, <laughs> a nice d'oeuvre. Uh, and that was, I mean, I think there was a reason, knowing Nico and the, my spooky way he works, um, when I turned up to the retreat and you were there, like, oh, I know that bloke, I'll, I'll listen to you, his podcast. Glenn does have a podcast, by the way, who, um, uh, is, has, how long have you been doing the podcast? The What's Dent it? podcast, I think maybe four years now. Yeah. And how how often do you roll it out? What's your what's your sort of frequency? Um, down to about one a month. Yeah. At this point, it used to be weekly, mm. uh, but now it fits in really well with the ecosystem. Yeah. Like we've got a, usually, I'll just like talking to some of our real standout clients. Um, but I also just decided with Mila, didn't want to be a full time podcaster along with sort of everything else as well so um lovely to have met you at the retreat and for a number of reasons we kept in touch and i'm here doing farm tour and chats about cows and actually we haven't looked for a spot to put the cow in your concentrate pit yet we must do that first yeah. oh after this um Go cows work out and what chickens kind of cows we got cows and, yeah what sort of cows what are you gonna do with them how does a heifer get pregnant um <laughs> Where the fences go, get the gloves out. <laughs> Back to basics, mate. Um, and you're, you're, you've been very kind to um, chat with me um, on many occasions and and help us with what we're doing in our our eco business ecosystem and our services and our products, which has been wonderful. And it's and the lovely th- and I, I guess it's a bit of a plug for you, but I guess it's a bit of a pur- not a purge, but it's, it's a way to express that um, what it's meant to me is that for years I kind of you know touching on KPI and and the book and. For years, I kind of had a sense that there was more to what we were doing. You know, there was more. There was a there was a structure, and there was a kind of a a way to piece this together. And in my mind, it was just all in pieces. You know, and in some ways, it, it, it's it's coming together. And so, I have to thank you, Glenn, for I guess creating um, the opportunity to um, help pull the things we are doing together in a much more um, sympathetic and synergistic way and add some things and probably take a few things away as well, I suspect, you know. Hopefully not, hopefully, hopefully not this podcast. You might say, mate, this is actually shit. You should stop doing this. Well, mate, when I saw <laughs> what you do, um, you know, in terms of things that would change the world if they were to be at scale, mm. you know, I think the world would be a much, much better place if uh, if what you did was at you know, scale. 
global mm. scale. I mean, you're at a wonderful scale now, but you know, regen agriculture, biodynamics, the the idea <clears throat> of you know us being able to gain our sustenance, and for farmers to be able to be what is it productive, profitable, and purposeful. purposeful. It's a beautiful thing. Mm. Um, and it's a paradigm that needs to be changed. And uh, there needs to be a, uh, a counterweight and a counterbalance against that. And, of course, there's lots of people doing lots of really good things. But, you know, you in particular are, uh, you know, one of the people that I think is, uh, is going to move the world in, in big ways. And, and I just wanted to rub up next to you and <laughs> come along for the ride. <laughs> well, feelings mutual, I have to say. Um, as I say, I'm not necessarily an expert in anything, but I, I kind of like the idea of bringing experts together. You know, um, in a way that is um, again synergistic for for their topics and their experiences, and 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 make that available to people. So sounds we'll, like we'll a good expertise. It. Yeah, I th- well, I think so, and I think you know, I, I enjoy doing it, and I really enjoy these podcasts. And I have to say, I've really enjoyed this one, Flynn. Um, you know, that's not to say I've I've not enjoyed any. I've always. <laughs> <laughs> My previous guests don't. It's all good. They may not have enjoyed it, but, but I've enjoyed all of them. Um, Glenn, we're going to wrap it up. This next session is going to be just for our Patreon members um, who support us every month, and it's their choice, and we love the fact that they do. It's, it's, it's a voluntary contribution to supporting the podcast, um, and for that they get all sorts of little extra bits. So we're going to give them an extra bit. You're going to be the extra bit. I'm the extra bit. <laughs> Have you ever been an extra bit before? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. What I, I don't want to know about the Olympics. That was a time that was probably best forgotten. <laughs> thanks, mate. We'll, mate, thanks we'll for having me. Catch you with the uh, the next little bit in a minute. Appreciate thanks for your time, you. mate. Really Cheers. appreciate it. And on next week's episode of the Regenerative Journey, I speak with Terry McCosker. It's taken us took us a couple of years to track him down, and finally did. This is a part. This is a two parter. So next week is part one. I caught up with Terry in the Botanic Gardens, uh, the City Botanic Gardens in Brisbane, and uh, I hope you and I trust you enjoy this episode with the uh, the legend that is Terry McCosker as much as I did interviewing him. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.